Okay, so um, this work has been uh, largely funded by the Cooperative Research Center for Weed Management in Australia, and we have also got some funding from the biosecurity people. And basically, when we started doing this work, uh, we were combining population dynamic models with economics. Uh, the focus is on uh, weeds in natural environments. And um, we had a couple of workshops with ecologists, and our approach was received, uh, um, you know, favorably. But we were always told, if you're in a natural environment and you want to eradicate something, you need to find it first. So we kind of looked around for some way of measuring detectability, trying to measure how to connect the search effort to the probability of finding something. And we have found this thing called search theory, which was developed by the US uh, military. And I'll talk about that a bit later on. Uh, so basically, the issues that we were tackling was, um, first, how can we measure detectability? Then, how many search and control missions will be required to eradicate an invasion? and how intensive these this, uh, this missions should be, and so that would be in terms of search effort, human or person time. Um, another question is, what is the probability of eradication in a given number of years if you invest a given number of dollars, and there is some trade-off there? And finally, how do the attributes of the invasion and the environment uh, will affect all these the answers to all these questions. Okay, so basically our strategy was to, um, there is a pointer but I can hardly see the screen from here, so. Uh, what basically was to combine three different types of models. So we have search theory, which I explain in a minute. That one um, provides information on the proportion of individuals that you will detect and kill. Then that goes into a population dynamics model, which is based on a very standard matrix, uh, projection matrix model, and that uh, follows the evolution of the invasion and the size of the seed bank over time, and that goes into an economic model where you can then estimate your, um, the, the effects or the cost of search effort, um, how many years it would take to eradicate this invasion, how to allocate your budget, and so on. And here we have the inputs to the models, and um, we try to keep the inputs as simple as possible because the idea of this is, is, um, is more like a general um, sort of analysis tool for preliminary analysis when you find an invasion and you're trying to decide how, how much would it cost, how long would it take, things like that. Okay, so search theory was initially developed by the, by the Navy. Basically, it was to find submarines. Uh, later, it was also applied for um, detecting mines and other things. Uh, these days, it's also used in search and rescue operations. Um, it basically relates search effort to the probability of detecting a target. And there are two concepts here which are key for the uh, application of search theory. The first one is coverage, and the other one is effective sweep width, which is a measure of detectability. So we have a formula here for coverage. But essentially, what coverage uh, measures is the relative area that you effectively search out of the total area, and that takes into account um, 
the detectability of the target. So if you look at those, at those letters there, you have, um, you have the search speed, you have the time searching, and then you have the effective sweep width, which I explained later, that the detectability. And then in the denominator, you have the area that you are searching. Okay, so how do you measure detectability? Now, if you consider um, searcher walking on a path, so we have here um, in the middle, we have a search path, uh, and then we have the la lateral range. Here is basically the distance where the target is from the searcher. And uh, in the vertical axis, we have the probability of detecting the target. So if you are on the search path, if your target is on the search path, you have a probability of one of finding it. As the target is far away from you, the probability drops. And what effective sweep width is, is basically the area under that curve. And um, what you do to estimate effective sweep width is basically to fi find a rectangle which has the same area as that curve, and that makes it much simpler to do the calculations because you don't have to integrate under the curve every time you want to calculate. So those areas labeled B, basically the total area there is the same as the total area labeled A, and that's relevant later when I talk about how you can estimate effective sweep width by doing some field work, some experiments. Okay, now once you know your effective sweep width and you know the speed of search, obviously the speed would depend on the characteristics of the environment, how difficult it is to traverse this place. And, uh, and then you can decide on your search efforts and estimate your coverage. Now, here we have three lines. Uh, so we have the coverage in the horizontal axis and the probability of detecting the targets or the proportion of targets detected in the vertical axis. So the green line there is uh, what's called a definite range sensor. So that's essentially a theoretical sensor which would find everything in a given rectangle and nothing outside of that rectangle. So basically that's a perfect sensor. When you have a coverage of one with that sort of sensor, you get a probability of one. So you detect everything, you detect all your targets. If you follow a random path in the search area, this is the sort of probability that you obtain. So you can see that there is diminishing returns to your search effort there. So a coverage of one gives you a probability of detection of about 0.62 or something. If you follow parallel, a parallel search pattern with equidistant uh, tracks, then you get a uh, better probability of detection, which is shown there. So for example, at a coverage of one, you would detect about 80% of your targets. So having this measure gives you some idea of, or, or basically allows you to relate your search effort to your probability of detection, and therefore then you can estimate the probability of killing the plants that you're looking for. Obviously, this would apply also to other organisms, not just to plants, but we're looking at plants here. All right, and the, in terms of the matrix, this is a fairly standard um, procedure. You have a projection matrix that represents the population dynamics. So the rows and the columns represent different life stages. What I'm showing you here would be a perennial plant that, uh, that takes one year to reach maturity. And what we have, you can think of the, the rows represent to and the columns represent from. So for example, this is new seeds, the seed bank, the juveniles and the adults there. The, uh, what this indicates here is that each adult uh, produces 1,500 uh, seeds. Uh, what you have here is the uh, survival of seeds in the seed bank, and what you have here is the germination rate. Here you have the survival of juveniles into uh, adults and from, uh, uh, the survival of adults from one year to the next. And basically, um, that matrix is associated with a given growth rate, which uh, is, is uh, represented by lambda there. In this case, we have a 1.5, this particular matrix. What this means is that if you do nothing, the size of the invasion would be 1.5 times next year what it was this year. 
So that can be very handy when estimating these parameters. And then you have your, what's called the population vector, and basically you have those x's represent the number of individuals in each age, age group. So you have x1 is new seeds, x2 is the seed bank, and so on. And then all you do is multiply your matrix times your vector, and then you obtain the prop, uh, an estimate of the population in the following time period. And I should mention here that uh, we separate the new seeds and the seed bank to allow for dispersal, because normally you would have new seeds are the ones that get dispersed. Once the seeds fall in the seed bank, they might just stay there. Of course, I mean, there might be some floods or there might be some organisms that move the seeds, but in general, especially when you have uh, seeds that are dispersed by birds or by wind, um, the dispersable seeds will be the new seeds. This model at this stage is not specially explicit. It just looks at one area as a whole. It assumes it is homogeneous. So this complication in the model is just thinking about the future when we can make this a bit specially explicit. All right, there is um, some assumptions there for what I show you as a base case, and these assumptions get changed. And this is essentially just to illustrate the sort of information that you need. As I said before, you're trying to keep the, the number of parameters required as small as possible, so we just try to find the key characteristics. So you can see the search parameters. We have time, speed, or the perceptual range, or detectability, and the effectiveness of your control agent. So that's the proportion of organisms that get treated which are killed. And then you have the biological parameters, which are just basically demographic parameters. Okay, so one thing you can do with this model is to derive what economists call isoquants. What you have here is, um, in the horizontal axis you have the detectability, in the vertical axis you have the search time, and each one of these lines represents a given number of years to eradication. So, for example, this one here represents 15 years to eradication. In other words, this is a trade-off. As your detectability increases, you can decrease your search time and achieve the same number of years to eradication. And you can see that uh, moving from 25 to 45 years to eradication, essentially what you are doing is you are using less uh, search time. Okay, so this can be very handy to look at these trade-offs between your um, expenditures and the probability that you will um, eliminate something in a given number of years. All right, another thing you can do with this is, <coughs> sorry, um, for a given eradication, for a, for a given detectability, how would your search time affect the years to eradication? So we're looking at a different dimension here with the detectability constant. And we have three different types of weeds here. We have a Perennial, which I call base, is just the base case we're looking at. We have a perennial with long-lived seeds, which is the red line, and we have an annual seed. Now you can see that, uh, you know, that search time in terms of hours per hectare. So if you, uh, as you increase your search time, you can see that there is a very quick drop in your years to eradication. Uh, and eventually you reach a flat area where, you know, you cannot decrease your search to eradicate, uh, sorry, your time to eradication anymore because obviously the longevity of the seed bank will constrain how quickly you can eradicate this plant because obviously you cannot detect the seeds, you have to wait until they germinate and go kill the seedlings. Okay, now once you inc include probabilities there, so basically we introduce probabilities around the demographic parameters and the search parameters. And what we have here is four different scenarios, four different types of plants. So the first one is an annual plant. Then we have a perennial with short-lived seeds, a uh, perennial with long-lived seeds, and a perennial with increased time to maturity. So instead of in, uh, reaching maturity in one year, it takes three or five years to reach maturity. Uh, and then you have two different probability distributions there. Uh, the blue one represents what you would obtain if your search effort is one hour per hectare. And the second one represents what you would obtain with two hours per hectare. Obviously, number two would be more expensive than number one. Uh, but you can see that increasing your search effort 
not only decreases your time to eradication, but it also makes these probability distributions a bit narrower, so it also makes, uh, uh, gives you a bit more certainty about how long it would take to eradicate these, um, these plants. All right, so uh, then we introduce inputs. Essentially, the two main inputs for, um, for these weeds could be labor and chemicals. These two graphs are based on some work that Chris uh, did in the Galapagos. And uh, it just shows that as the stems per hectare increase, your labor input increase, uh, increase a bit more than proportionally. And the herbicide is more or less a straight line there. So you put that information in there, you include the cost of labor and the cost of herbicides, and then you can estimate your costs of control depending on how much or, or, or how many years um, you want to eradicate the plants in. So there you can see with the annual plant, your total cost, those are total costs. Uh, okay, in the horizontal axis you have years to eradication, vertical axis has total cost in uh, thousands of, of dollars. Uh, so you have your uh, annual plant, the cost just decreases as your years to eradication decrease, so essentially that, uh, that particular plant with the parameters that we use would um, indicate that you are uh, better off just containing the plant rather than eradicating it. When you look at the perennial plant, number two there, you can see that in this case you minimize your cost in about 30 years to eradication. And so on with the other ones. Now, this can be a useful graph even if you don't know the benefits. So you, you, you will notice that I haven't mentioned any benefits to eradication here. I'm only concentrating on the costs. Now, if you don't know the benefits, you can still uh, have some, uh, make some um, educated um, guesses, I guess, about the trade-offs. So, for example, if you have, um, you can see here that uh, you can eradicate in 30 years uh, at a cost of $170,000. You could decide that you try, you might want to eradicate in, um, I don't know, 80, what's that, 15 years or something. It would cost you $180,000. So the question you can ask yourself is, is it worth it to spend an extra $10,000? This is in present value terms uh, for, um, for an early eradication. Uh, you, in doing, you know, in making this decision, you might just think about what the value of the environment you are trying to save is. And you might also like to think about the fact that you have an opportunity cost there. You know, if you don't have to use those resources in this eradication, then you can go and move to another invasive species. So those are the sorts of things that you you might have to decide even if you don't know what the exact benefits of this are. Okay, now, measuring detectability. Um, this, this is one of the key aspects of this model. And what I like to do one day is to actually come up with tables, kind of at least default values for uh, different types of environments and different types of plants. And the Navy actually uses, or the Coast Guard, I think, uses this for uh, effective sweep widths for um, the detectability of ships or um, of uh, individuals just in the, uh, in the water depending on the conditions and wind and fog and things like that. So if we could develop um, this sort of thing, um, it would be very handy. This is an example from New Zealand, uh, from Harris, Brown, and Timmins there. And what they did here, they don't use effective sweep widths. They define visibility as the distance where you can find 80% of your targets. And they run a workshop. Is that five minutes, the workshop? Oh, zero. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. This is a way you can estimate the effective sweep width. Essentially, you can plant uh, objects randomly in an environment. You can send searchers to look for these objects. You know where everything is because you put them there. Your searchers go find what they find, and they, they don't find what they don't find. And then, the interception of those two cores gives you half of, half of the effective sweep width. So if you can do that for different environments, then you can start producing some of these tables, at least to give you ballpark figures. Okay, so we're still in the process of testing this, um, this model. I mean, it's based on, you know, it's on solid ground, I guess, in terms of the ecology and the economics. The question is whether the search theory uh, approach is really working. Uh, so I think it has some potential. 
it can contribute for planning and, at the, and evaluation, at least for preliminary allocation of resources. Uh, and it combines demographic characteristics as well as logistic factors. Um, um, and um, one of the interesting findings is that the dem demographic parameters affect the costs, but they also affect the shape of your cost function. Thank you.